Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at Tread Athletics. And today we're gonna to be breaking down Yoshinobu Yamamoto and talking about how does he throw so hard as an undersized pitcher. He's been up to 99 at five foot 10, listed at 176 pounds, and talk about some of the unique aspects of his mechanics. Obviously some things are probably jumping out at you right away just looking at this clip, but we're gonna break it down. We're not gonna get too much into kind of the other aspects, not gonna to talk too much about Arsenal, you know, speculating on, on which team he's gonna land with, anything like that. So more so gonna keep it as much as we can related to the mechanical side. I might just kind of talk about those things very briefly. So he's mid-90s guy, up to 99 miles an hour. He's widely regarded as one of, if not the best pitcher in Japan over the past several years. Again, Roki Sasaki probably has the best raw stuff, but he's potentially the best pitcher over there right now. He just won his third straight triple crown. And from the age of 18 to 24, he's posted a 1.72 ERA. He also has an extremely low home run per nine rate. So he's really not letting up any sort of uh, significant damage. He's a fastball splitter pitcher. I've seen it listed as a fork ball in some other places. And that accounts for about 70 to 75% of his total pitch usage. So again, fastball splitter guy, pretty common for a lot of Japanese pitchers. And then also has a kind of a loopy curveball that he'll drop in for strikes. He has a cutter and he has a slider that he's throwing very rarely. But again, wouldn't be surprised if he begins to lean on that and use that a little bit more once he actually gets to the States. As far as his fastball, general overview, he does have above average MLB velocity for that pitch. Very good velocity over in Japan, but still above average from an MLB standpoint. Has good carry on the pitch. He also releases from a low release height, which generates a high vertical approach angle. So he has that rising fastball that everybody seems to be after and that teams tend to value. Splitter, he throws it exceptionally hard and he has a lot of arm side movement on the pitch. Now the curveball, he's throwing it for a strike about 70% of the time. So it's it's really a get me over curveball. He's only throwing it about 76, 77 miles an hour. So again, wouldn't be surprised if he maybe adopts an 80, 82, 83 mile an hour curveball that he can throw a little bit firmer once he does get over to the States. Because again, he's using that primarily as a strike pitch, purely just looking at the potential kind of stuff grades of that pitch would most likely grid out a little bit better if he threw that a little bit harder. If you want to learn more about his arsenal and go in significant more depth on that side of things, I'm going to link a video by Lance Brozdowski down below. Uh, but he's got a fantastic channel. Subscribe to him and go check out his video. So one of the kind of elephants in the room, you know, when I posted that I was going to be doing a breakdown, so a lot of the comments were mentioning that people think that he's going to get hurt, right? He's undersized. He's throwing pretty hard. He's relatively max effort. Comments like he throws all arm. His arm will be toast in two years. He's too small, right? A lot of comments like this. And I'm sure there's a number of MLB executives that are thinking along the same lines, just looking at his general stature and looking at certain examples historically of pitchers who haven't held up, right? The Tim Lincecums of the world. However, to this point, he has avoided major injuries. He's been pitching consistently since 18. There's plenty of taller pitchers that have gotten hurt too, right? Steven Strasburg, even Jacob DeGrom, guys with quote unquote perfect mechanics, right? I'm not gonna be the guy to, to find any sort of flaw in Jacob DeGrom's mechanics. That doesn't mean that he still was able to stay healthy. So there's so many variables that go into whether a pitcher can stay healthy. So many variables we can see and we can control and then so many that we can't see and we can't control that it's really tough to pin something like injury risk on one or two mechanical variables or on just a, a height to weight or body stature or anthropometry. That being said, if you do predict that a pitcher who is throwing 95 to 100 miles an hour will get hurt, one, you're an a-hole. But two, you're an a-hole who's probably eventually gonna be right. Simply because if you look at how many pitchers have had, for example, Tommy John surgery or UCL injury at the big league level, so many of these guys are eventually going to run into some sort of major injury. Even if it's like a Justin Verlander scenario where he makes it until his late thirties before he ultimately does injuries UCL, like eventually you're gonna be right. So I'm not as interested in people basically predicting injuries because yes, at some point in a pitcher's career, if they're throwing this hard, they are putting an incredible amount of stress through their body eventually something will break down whether it's a very very minor thing or whether it's a little bit more major thing eventually you will be right however most of these injuries are not career ending some injuries are significantly more serious certain injuries there's a very high percentage chance that a pitcher does make it back to the previous level performance so people talk about so and so is going to blow his arm out as though that's the end of the story that's the end of the road you blow your arm out you're done we're not in the era of Sandy Koufax anymore, where if you blow your arm out, you're done. If a pitcher is able to produce 10 productive years and one year of that he was rehabbing from an injury, does that mean that that was an unsuccessful career? No, of course not. So I think while we shouldn't just sit back and accept that injuries are gonna happen and not be searching for solutions, it's this idea that like if somebody gets hurt, it's the absolute end of the world. Injuries do happen, we need to minimize the risk. In most cases, pitchers can work through those issues 
come back and be as good or better than they were before. Moving on, while I couldn't find a weight training routine for him, I was able to find this quote from a teammate on his physical routine, so read through this. From a mobility standpoint, because again, that quote really shines some light on how good his mobility is, I was able to find video of him doing lots of back bridges, thoracic extension type work, a scapular stability type work. He's doing handstands. There's a video here of him doing a single arm handstand up against a wall. So again, demonstrating impressive mobility, but also doing a ton of work from the actual scapular strengthening and stability side as well. The bottom line from the injury concerns is that we simply don't know whether he'll stay healthy, whether he'll hold up. He moves well, as we'll get into in a second here. He's athletic. He's been reasonably healthy to this point. If he does get hurt, chances are his career will continue after whatever setback he might have. And this goes for any pitcher that's pitching at this elite of a level who's throwing with this elite of stuff. Without motion capture data without force plate data i'm not able to spot anything that would be considered a major red flag within his mechanics that would clearly indicate a pending arm injury we simply don't know whatever team signs him is going to be taking some level of risk and of course they're already aware of this moving on to his mechanics there are a few things that i think are noteworthy and interesting to talk about one is the slide step so i haven't really seen any examples of a pitcher slide stepping out of the windup i'm sure it's happened before but yeah i have not seen this however i i don't dislike it right if, if this is what's comfortable for a pitcher if they happen to be comfortable out of a slide step and now in most cases right in the u.s if a pitcher is most comfortable out of a slide step which does happen then they just always pitch out of a stretch and they always do a slide step right that's what i did in college i was most comfortable out of a slide step so i just didn't throw out of the windup i didn't have a leg lift i just stuck to one thing what's interesting is that he's still interested in making that distinction and still he has a slide step step with runners on base but he still thought having that step into from the windup was worth having so it was appeared to be an attempt to simplify and simplify his delivery take out the leg lift but rather than just simplifying it to the greatest extent that he possibly could have he still felt it relevant to add in that step into so that's what i find most interesting now he's still hitting the exact same positions as he does from the stretch and if we go and we look at his his leg lift which he had last year he's still able to get into very similar positions when he actually drops into his back leg and shifts his weight down the mound. Here we'll take a look at his slide step. So ultimately I think that's one interesting piece is that he chooses to only slide step. Again, I'm speculating, but I'm, that's likely him attempting to simplify his lower half. The second thing that really stood out to me was his weight distribution. And when I say weight distribution, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about the frontal plane, so the side view and I'm looking at where is the head, where is the upper body relative to where the lower body is, relative to where the pelvis is. Now a pitcher who is staying excessively far back, right, that head might be stuck way over the back side. They're, lean, they're leaning way back, they're not shifting their weight, the head's staying way over the back foot, way over the back knee. Now he's an example of what I would call a front hip dominant pitcher. So his upper half is actually staying relatively far out front. He's keeping the head over the front hip. A lot of pitchers will keep the head over the front hip during their initial leg lift, and then as they drop into the backside, as they drop into the hinge, that head will shift back over the back hip so they can keep the upper half back into landing. He keeps the head over the front hip, and then he just maintains it there. So as he's moving down the slope, his upper half is relatively more forward in a more forward position or in that front hip dominant position than what you typically would see. However, this is not completely unique to him. You will see it at various times. Andres Munoz, Camilo Duvall, two examples of hard throwing pitchers who do land in this relatively forward position that some pitching coaches might view this and say that he's leaking forward. He's rushing the upper half. The upper half's getting out in front of the lower half. These are other, other ways of potentially describing the position that he's getting into here. However, there are so many examples of pitchers that can do this effectively and have done this effectively that I don't necessarily view this as a flaw just because the head is over the front hip instead of over the back hip into landing. You'll see that in order to create this type of position, he's also pairing it with limited shoulder tilt. In other words, the uphill shoulder tilt typically is associated with keeping the head back, keeping the upper half back and it's associated with a little bit of a higher glove side. For him, he keeps a low glove side. He sticks the arm straight out towards the target, but that, that elbow, that glove never go above shoulder height. And he's keeping a stacked torso. So he doesn't have much shoulder tilt and his glove arm stays low. So that allows him to keep his upper body 
out over front of the front hip. Now, while this works for him, and this works for other pitchers, one of the commonalities that you typically see with pitchers who land so forward like this is that they have exceptional mobility. Andres Munoz, Camilo Duvall, Billy Wagner, right? these are guys who have so much mobility and, and many times they have a lot of laxity in the shoulder. And so for them to take out all the slack in their shoulder at peak external rotation, they actually need to be a little bit further out front. They need more trunk extension. They need to be in that more forward flex position at, at ball release to actually unwind all the slack out of their arm. And you'll usually see the opposite for pitchers who are a little bit stiffer, through their, especially through their shoulder, um, as far as the, the amount of external rotation. Right? Justin Verlander is a guy who will honestly be a little bit uphill uh, landing in a lot of cases for the opposite reason. So one of my hypotheses is that pitchers who have significantly more mobility in their shoulders this might actually represent an optimal pattern for them in terms of what might be considered a leaking pattern for a lot of pitchers it might actually be optimal for the guys that have this level of uh, hyper laxity or hypermobility throughout their shoulders it's what allows them to get into the most stable position where they've unwound that that slack in the shoulder at max external rotation so that's that's one theory however for most pitchers i would consider this if not a flaw at least something to consider testing out and addressing and seeing if it helps. In general, when a pitcher gets this far forward, it leads to early extension on the back leg. They kind of lunge off the back side and the upper half gets way out in front and they aren't able to actually transfer or rotate and transfer any of that rotational energy from the back hip into the torso. And then the other piece of this is when pitchers land this far forward, in order to pull this off, they typically need really good thoracic extension to still be able to, to access all that range of motion in their shoulder. So if you have a pitcher with really bad shoulder mobility landing this far forward, that elbow is just gonna shoot forward and they're gonna push the ball. And so he's able to pull this off. He's got really good mobility, not just through his shoulder, but also through his thoracic spine. So he's able to pull this off, but I would exert caution if you're not a guy this, this athletic, this mobile, and you're landing with your head way over your front hip. Also worth noting, if we think about the momentum equation, there's a mass side to that equation, and then there's also a velocity piece to that equation. He's not a big guy. He doesn't have a lot of mass on his side. We'll compare him to Garrett Cole here in a second, which you might already have noticed in his kind of lower half patterns here, but he does not have the mass side of the equation. He makes up for that with the velocity side of the equation. And velocity here, we're talking about how aggressively he moves forward towards the target with his center of mass, with his lower half. So he's moving extremely aggressively towards the target with his lower half while still maintaining sequencing, still creating tension on the back side, still blocking that energy up the chain with his lead leg. And so again, you're seeing him compensate for being a generally smaller stature guy by moving extremely athletically, extremely aggressively towards the target. He's got very similar loading pattern to Garrett Cole. And I would consider this an IR load, so an internal rotation dominant load. And this is pretty obvious to see from what you can consider a knee to knee position. So obviously the knees closer together, the feet further apart. This is your classic hip internal rotation position. A lot of Japanese pitchers have this style. I do think it's partly just stylistic. There are kind of like different cultural norms as far as how pitchers move and then how they learn to move by observing others who throw in a certain way or the best pitchers in their country, how they move and then trying to emulate them. So there's, there's some of that, but also recognizing that there's likely some genetic predisposition there as well, where if you naturally have the hip structure to be able to move that way, and then you try to move that way, you're more likely to be able to move that way. But if somebody who had really poor hip internal rotation from let's say a different part of the world or just their, their general structure, their genetics, they tried to throw that way, they tried to throw with that knee to knee position, they're not gonna have the range of motion to actually do it. Uh, but you tend to see this be a very common uh, type of lower half load, lower half loading pattern, as far as the knee to knee, as far as showing the side of the foot or the bottom of the cleats towards the target, as opposed to opening up that lead leg early and showing more of that external rotation dominant pattern. But one interesting comp here that I've alluded to is Garrett Cole. Um, let's put him side by side here, that you can see specifically for the actual hinge, that forward stride, you can see the similarities here. And it's, it's pretty uncanny when you look at how they shift their weight. The pelvis is able to stay sideways, but not with a ton of coil. 
And again, look at the side of the lead foot as an indicator. You can look at the belt buckle as an indicator of pelvic rotation or pelvic coil. That belt buckle stays facing third base all the way up until right here. So all the way up until three frames before landing. That belt buckle is facing sideways, so that's one indicator. And then the side of the foot, the side of that, that cleat facing the target. So how long can he hold those two kind of landmarks? Sideways, sideways. This is why I really like the cue of stay sideways for pitchers who have good IR. It's a cue that I wish somebody had given me or I wish I had known in high school when I was just immediately flying open, reaching open my lower half and didn't understand how to hold closed, hold closed and maintain that as long as possible. But him and Garrett Gold both have this move in common and they both have really good directionality. So they're able to hold this tension, hold this closed position, keep the side of that foot facing the target as long as possible as they maintain that perfect direction towards the target, that linearity, the lower half, and then being able to unwind it and pop the hips open at the very last second. So it's building tension with direction, building tension with direction, building tension with linear direction, and then it's pop, hips pop open, and now all that linear momentum that was created is converted into rotational momentum and he's able to actually translate that up the chain into the trunk out and around into the arm and ultimately into the ball interestingly enough we talked about how the upper half leaking forward might actually be optimal for him garrett cold was a lot more similar to this pattern when he was in high school. As far as his head would get out a little bit far further in front, he had more of that front hip dominant pattern we talked about. Interestingly, when Garrett Cole got to professional baseball, that's one of the things that he seemed to want to clean up, seemed to make him a little bit more consistent over time. So interestingly enough, Garrett Cole was a little bit more similar with that and did adjust it. So honestly, if you look at Garrett Cole's upper half now, it's almost could be a comp of what Yoshinobu's upper half could be if somebody were to teach him to stay just a little bit further back. Again, it's dicey because he's already having so much success to go in and change. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if whatever team gets their hands on him does try to get him to stay back just a hair more to where his head is two inches further back at landing instead of so far over the front hip. When you compare him to Garrett Cole, a couple other things stand out. One is slightly earlier trunk rotation, which I wouldn't necessarily classify this as early trunk rotation, but when you compare it to Garrett Cole, he is slightly earlier with the trunk. So that is one noteworthy difference. And then again, the other, as we already talked about, is the more aggressive center of mass shift. So again, he's not 6'4", 225, 235 pounds. He doesn't have the mass side of the equation on his side. He makes up for that by moving significantly more aggressively towards the target than someone like a Garrett Cole, while still being able to achieve the mid upper 90s velocity of a Garrett Cole. From there, I'd like to bring your attention to the decel, the decelerative portion of the throw. So how well does he actually crack the whip? And cracking the whip is every bit as much about the acceleration phase as it is the deceleration phase. If you think about a whip crack phenomenon, it's not just that first phase, but it's also the second phase and the deceleration that actually cracks the whip and sends energy down and out into the tip of the whip. So when we're talking about the pitching delivery, what we're looking at is the pelvis's ability to hold tension, pop open at the last second, and then stick it. So as soon as that belt buckle does get facing the target, we ideally want to stick that and not have the hips continue to travel way around and continue rotating way around towards first base. So he sticks that very well, sends the energy up into the trunk, trunk closes the gap aggressively, sends that energy out and around into the shoulder, into ball release. And then again, you can see that his hand actually continues traveling and he slaps himself on the, on the back thigh, the back of his left thigh. And then he has a little bit of a recoil position there. You can see it more on this throw right here. But he has a very crisp snapping or crack to the whip. He doesn't just kind of continue to gently decelerate way off towards first base. He sticks the landing, pelvis stops rotating, decels, allowing the trunk to accelerate. Trunk stops rotating, decelerates, allows the arm to accelerate. And then he has that nice uh, recoil. The recoil is associated with guys who throw max effort. 
which again, you could argue that guys who are throwing max effort, it could be an injury risk factor, but it's par for the course when we're talking about 95 to 100 mile an hour pitchers, right? You're gonna get guys who are trying to throw max effort because that's typically what it takes to be able to throw 95 to 100 plus miles an hour. You're gonna get some of that, but it's also a sign of an efficient deceleration path. So I'm not personally sold on kind of this, this recoil position being a flaw or being indicative of injury necessarily. It is indicative of guys who are typically trying to throw with higher intensity, which indirectly is associated with throwing harder, injury risk, etc. So you might argue this is associated with injury. I would argue it's a sign of an efficient deceleration path and deceleration process. And then a final thing I wanna bring your attention to is his, his eyes or his vision. So you probably haven't looked at that yet, even as I played this clip through, but take a moment, watch his eyes. So he's, he's bringing his eyes somewhere towards third base or halfway down the third baseline. And I wasn't able to find any clips where he doesn't do this. So this seems to be very much a staple in his pre-pitch routine. And this is actually more common than you'd think if, you, if you've watched other videos of mine, this is again, extremely common even though it goes counter to what a lot of more traditional coaches will teach, which is keep your eyes on the target, the entire pitch, the entire delivery. That never worked for me. The second I started looking down or looking away, breaking that focus and then picking up the target again, I started throwing more strikes. He's actually a command pitcher. He's a finesse pitcher who also has power stuff. And yet he's looking away from the target. How can that be? But my theory, what I've always felt is that it's kind of like an infielder who just athletically fields the ball, doesn't even have time to think about it. They just have to rely on their natural instincts, their reactions, and they don't have time to sit there and, and try to process exactly where they're trying to throw the ball. They pick up the target quickly and deliver a strike to first base. So they're in way more of that automatic processing side of their brain versus this, this conscious processing side of their brain where they have a lot of time to think about what's going on and kind of lose that focus. For me, when I tried to get the sign, get the target, stare at the target, start my delivery, still stare at the target, hold that focal point the entire time, I would lose focus. I would lose the ability to hold that focus for that long. And so looking away, looking down for a brief instant, for me and for a lot of other pitchers, it can be a very effective way to stay in that kind of automatic, almost infielder-like side of your brain. And ironically makes it easier to repeat, easier to throw strikes. Now, I don't know if that's just something he's naturally done or if he was taught to do that, but one thing I couldn't find for this video, but I'm positive it's out there because I've seen it before, is I've seen a, a string of different drills that Japanese pitchers were doing, and I swear that one of the drills had the pitchers stop and hover right here in this position, holding the ball out front, holding the glove arm out front, looking at the ball and then throw from there. So if anyone has a video of that drill or knows what that drill is called or knows anyone who has done that drill, I'd be super curious to hear down below in the comments so that I can find that video. But I again would be curious, this could also be for him, if he just was really drilled and cued to like kind of start in this position, hold the ball out front, look this way and then throw and he did thousands of those reps, that could simply be as a result of doing more, doing some of those drills like earlier on in his career. So I'd love to see video of that drill. I couldn't find it for this video. I did look, um, but I swear I've seen that video before. So that could be another alternative. But if you're struggling to throw strikes and you've been told that you have to find focus on the target the entire time, you cannot break your eyes away from the target at all. There are so many pitchers who violate that rule that I would definitely encourage you to consider playing with the vision, playing with your eyes and playing with what happens if I break that focus for an instant, if I look slightly down during leg lift, do I throw more strikes? Is that comfortable? And a lot of you guys are probably gonna be surprised with the results coming out of that experiment. Just some closing thoughts on Yoshinobu. I think whoever signs him is gonna get a pitcher with elite pitch ability and plus stuff, right? That's a given, but ultimately time will tell if he can stay healthy. I think it gives us a lot of reasons to be excited. I think it's also exciting for Roki Sasaki coming over here in the future. It's just an exciting time for the game of baseball and I'm looking forward to seeing him pitch in a big league uniform. Thanks for watching guys. So how exactly does remote coaching work? You will have unlimited access to text and email your coach, hop on weekly FaceTime calls and receive regular mechanical and training updates. Each day, your plan will detail exactly what to do from start to finish with instructional videos for every single throwing drill, mobility routine, and lifting exercise. Nobody's going to do the work for you, but we can show you the path to get there. It's your career. Let's get to work.